Austin is able to participate in a program like this. This is our first Woodrow Wilson Fellow at SFA. And it's a great honor that we're able to do this. My name is Mark Berenger. I'm the chair of the History Department and was a member of the planning committee for, for our Woodrow Wilson Fellow. Um, who is, of course, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend? Ms. Townsend is the eldest of Robert and Ethel Kennedy's 11 children. While she was growing up, although a very active political family, girls in the family were really not expected to run for office. But when her uncle, President John F. Kennedy, was assassinated, her father wrote to her and told her this. As the eldest of the next generation, he said, you have a particular responsibility. Be kind to others and work for your country. Her father, of course, was Robert F. Kennedy, United States Senator, front-running Democratic presidential candidate in June 1968, he was assassinated. Ms. Townsend graduated from Radcliffe College with a bachelor's degree in history and literature. She studied at the University of New Mexico, where she took a law degree in 1978. During her tenure as the first female lieutenant governor of Maryland from 1995 to 2003, Ms. Townsend focused on reducing crime and promoting economic development. She served in the United States Department of Justice as Deputy Assistant Attorney General and on the State Board of Education. In 2010, she became the chair of the American Bridge, a nonprofit organization that raises funds for Democratic candidates and causes. She serves on the board of directors of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation and on the board of the Points of Light, a national nonpartisan organization that's dedicated to solving serious social problems through voluntary service. Mrs. Townsend is the author recently of a book titled Failing America's Faith. How today's churches are mixing God with politics and losing the way. Please, please join me in welcoming our Woodrow Wilson Fellow. This is Kathleen Kennedy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so tell me again, I have two classes here or three? Three. Oh my gosh. Okay, so are you all sitting together? No, You're all divided. So we're going to have a competition, like who does a better job, right? So what is this class? Well, you're mixed. Oh, you are mixed. So you are mixed. Okay. I said, are you all mixed? Are you, yeah, no. Okay, so tell me the three classes. I'm going to start to ch call on you if you don't. <laughs> Like, I mean, I gr I'm going to tell you a little bit about growing up. We were called on. So what class are you? Social work 350 policy. Social work. And what are you focusing on? 415, sorry. <laughs> it's hard to get those numbers straight. <laughs> I understand. Social policy analysis. Uh, social policy. Like, what are you, what po social policy are you focused on right now? Um, just kind of <coughs> how it all works, basically. Like policy analysis and <laughs> Right, but what would be, oh, so there's not a particular policy you're focused on. We just, we just study on how to analyze policies effectively. Okay, I'm going to give you a challenge. I'm going to give you a policy and see what you think of that. Okay, that's policy. That's good. Social policy. So whether we should have social, um, social security, would that be a policy? Medicare, Medicaid, does that all ring a bell? Okay. Anything else? Oh, that's good. Well, there are two parts of social working, I guess. You know, taking care of an individual and then sort of changing policy. So that's, be curious. Okay, so we can talk about that. That sounds good. What's the next one? Finish 235. Oh, huh, and what is that? Conversation and literature and some grammar review. Oh, so like there's no connection between the two. <laughs> Okay, I just, I just want to know what kind of challenge you want to give me. Okay, you know, usually we could talk a lot about social policy. Spanish. So you're learning Spanish? You know Spanish. No, you know it pretty well. She's, she, yeah, she, 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 she's pretty good. Um, okay, okay we, great. We are uh, discussing a lot of topics because it's a conversation class, um, and I'm the professor of that class. I, I like to use... Um, so you might discuss immigration. Immigration. So that would be a policy for you guys. I'm trying to think of things that would connect you. Like, so we're all on the same wavelength. So that sounds like we should talk about immigration. That makes sense? Okay, the, who's the third group? 
okay, I'm going to find you guys. <laughs> it's okay. We're Spanish 435. Are you another Spanish class? It's a Spanish Portuguese comparison class. You compare the two languages? It so, never would have occurred to me to do. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> They're very similar. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would think. Okay, well, that's really important. That's really important. Great. So I'm going to give you some choices, okay, because I figured this democracy. Um, I can talk a little bit about my family, you know, so that's, I could do that. I could talk a little bit about what it was like to be lieutenant governor on different policies. I'm actually now working at the State Department um, to encourage more students to go to study in Latin America and more study students from Latin America to come here. So I could talk a little bit about that and see what you're thinking about. Or we could talk about immigration policy. Or we could do all four, or we could do something totally different. So can you remember those four choices? I'm gonna ask, for, I'm gonna ask you to vote on what you wanna do. I, you know, democracy, right? Okay. So one, you can talk about Kennedy's. Oh, I can just also talk about, you know what I've noticed in this class? There are a lot of women in this class. We can talk about women in power. Power. We could talk about immigration. And we can talk about all of them. We'll just decide the order that you like. And what else did I say? Uh, Latin America student exchanges. Was there anything else? Oh, my lieutenant governor. Five. It gets its own thing. You know, I don't think this is very clear. We're moving to green. Lieutenant governor. Lieutenant governor. Oh, and then religion and politics. How about that? Okay, anything else? Any other topics you want to talk about? What is it? The oh, the economy. Excellent idea. Okay. Got it? You got seven choices? Okay. Now we're going to have, who wants to help me? You've given up on helping me. Would you help me? <laughs> what is your name? Jacqueline. Jacqueline. That's a beautiful name. My aunt was a Jacqueline. Good. After her. You were? Mm -hmm. That is so cool. <laughs> that is so great. Where do you live? Um, Friendswood, Texas. Friendo? Friendswood. I don't know Friendswood. It's South Houston. Like South, Houston. South Houston. Oh, great. Okay, that is so great. That's so nice for your parents. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, would you count how many vote for each? Mm -hmm. And if it's over, if nobody raises their hand, you don't have to count. Okay. So we'll go down. There's six, right? Why don't we start with this one? Seven. There's seven. You see, uh, economy. Who wants to talk about the economy? One vote. Two. Three votes. Four. Okay, that's kind of pathetic. <laughs> I mean, come on. Okay, well, we're going to talk about it. Don't worry, because it's important. So four up for the economy. How much religion and politics? I got a lot more votes on religion and politics. You can raise your hand. <laughs> can, I, can you vote for multiple? Or just, yeah, yeah, you can vote for multiple. Okay. <laughs> okay, it'll be interesting. We could do a test, but we don't have that much time to test. What would happen if we vote for multiples or if you could only vote for one? So, multiples, how many? 24. 24, that's a lot. Okay. Lieutenant Governor. Three, seven. Okay, nobody cares about that. No, it's such okay. I get it. I get it. Nobody cares. All right. <laughs> Latin America student exchanges. Oh, you got a good number. Many more than lieutenant governor. Very interesting. <laughs> cool. Great. I am very excited about that. Can you write? There it is. Immigration. What? I don't want to too many because I want them all. Can we talk about? You want them all? 
Okay, well, you're going to leave. You have a problem with the economy. No, <laughs> I think it's so interesting. Twenty how many? Twenty six. Twenty six, cool. Okay, women in power. Well, that's t popular too. Okay. <laughs> Did any men raise their hand at women in power? <laughs> One. Two, two. Very good. You're brave guys. You gotta know it's happening. Okay. And Kennedy's. <laughs> okay. You guys like to raise your hand at every single one. I mean, you have no discrimination whatsoever, I can tell. You're just like right there. Okay. All right. So this is what we'll do. We'll do, um, I'll do a, call a little bit about Kennedy's. And then I will talk about immigration, um, Latin American exchanges, because I need to know about that, women in power. Maybe I'll get to religion and politics. Um, and then you can ask questions, okay? And you can ask questions at any point, if you're, whenever you want, because I'm here to entertain you. <laughs> it's kind of a joke. <laughs> okay. So, um, as you know, I was, grew up in a, the Kennedy family. I was the oldest of 11 children, um, which for those of you who don't know it, is a lot of kids. It's a lot. And how many of you come from large families? How many do you come from? I have four sisters. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. Yes? You have 12 kids. God, that is a lot. <laughs> that's even more than 11. Um, how, where are you in that? <laughs> oh, you, that's good that you raised your hand because oftentimes middle kids get lost. So good for you for not being lost. That's great. Who else raised their hand in large families? How many do you have? Seven. Seven. So that's the large too. That's great. And where are you in that? I'm the youngest. Oh, good. They're very special. You mean spoiled? Yeah. No, they're very special. My my uncle Teddy, Senator Kennedy, was the youngest of nine, and he became one of the best senators in the United States. And my sister, Rory, is the youngest of 11, and she's been nominated twice for an Oscar, because she's an Oscar-winning, uh, she's a documentary filmmaker. So the youngest often do well. The, the parents have time for the youngest. <laughs> I'm sorry about that middle. <laughs> and uh, who else that raised their hand? Yes, back there? Uh, six. Six, that's good, that's a good number. So we grew up in this large family, and we grew up at a time um, when my uncle became the President of the United States, which was terrific, and you know, my father was the Attorney General uh, at the time of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, my other uncle, then Teddy, ran for United States Senate. So I had this a little bit unrelated to women. So what I grew up with was a lot of men being powerful in, the exter you know, in, in politics, and that's what I, what I saw. Growing up in my family, um, my parents thought it was very ex important for us to know what was going on in the world. Um, so, you know, every night at dinner, uh, we were quizzed about current events. And so it was, a, as you can imagine, really important where you sat, right, at the dinner table. Right next to my mother, you just had to read the front page. But as you went around the table, you really had to know what was going on. And um, my mother thought this idea of current events was such a great idea that she, I don't know, do you, do you guys ever do carpools? Does that ring a bell? So she would always quiz all the kids in the carpool. <laughs> what happened? They said, oh no, what happened today? Mrs. Kennedy is driving. So there was this whole sense, you know, she thought it was a really good idea. You know, if my, when I drive the carpool, I have four daughters and they would die if I even opened my mouth to talk to the, their friends in the carpool. So it was a very different time. Um, we were quizzed on current events. We were quizzed also on history. You know, we had to know American history really well. Um, clearly, I could have learned a lot more about Nagadoches, which I've now learned is the oldest city in Texas. So thank you for, um, <laughs> I've seen Stephen Austin's uh, statue, which is very cool. And I've seen where Sam Houston, I guess, had his law office. So I'm very excited to be here and to know a lot, learn more about the history of East Texas. Uh, the, we were also on Sunday, we were expected to um, do a report on somebody famous in history or memorize a poem. 
So there was a lot of that. Every night we said prayers together and my father read the Bible to us. My uncle ran for president. There was a lot of prejudice against Catholics, you may have heard. Did you study that at all? So that, for instance, Billy Graham, does that ring, name ring a bell? He wrote a letter and said to all the people in the churches, don't vote for John Kennedy. Um, and along with a guy called Norman Vincent Peale, who came up with this notion of the power of positive thinking. It was the most popular. He was sort of the Oprah of his day. And he said, don't vote for John Kennedy because then the Pope will control the United States. And he, John Kennedy was about to lose the election. And he came to Houston and spoke to the ministers and said, you know, you can't be prejudiced against Catholics. You can't judge somebody. Um, whether they're worthy, you send them to war, you don't ask if they're Catholic. You, you ask them to give up their lives, you don't ask if they're Catholic. So you shouldn't say that the minute you're baptized, you can't be president of the United States. And he did win the election by a very small margin because there was, at that time, a lot of anti-Catholic prejudice. But I think that anti-Catholic prejudice made him very sympathetic to the um, African Americans who were... Um, at that time, uh, you know, not allowed to vote, not allowed to sit at the lunch counters, and there was a large, this was, I'm sure you've all studied the civil rights movement. Some of you may not know that in 1960, when my uncle was running for president, um, Martin Luther King was arrested um, he, uh, for, I think, I don't know, for speeding on the Georgia back roads, and he was then sentenced, you know, have you ever been arrested for speeding? None of you have. Well, I have. <laughs> I mean, a lot. <laughs> I don't know if it's arrested. It's stopped. And, you know, when you get stopped, I get a ticket. Actually, I don't know if you do this in Nagadoches, but in Washington, D.C., they now have cameras. Do they do that? Like, every month or so, I'm getting another ticket. So I just want to explain that, you know, I know I shouldn't admit this, but it's true. But so you get a ticket and you had to pay, you know, $50 or some horrible amount of money. Um, but when he was stopped, they sentenced him to four months hard labor, which makes no sense for stop for a speeding ticket, right? It's completely unjust and terrible. And so um, my uncle Sarge Shriver said to President Kennedy, who was then running for president, you should call up Mrs. King's. Coretta Scott King and tell her you're sympathetic. And um, he did. And then my father was, didn't know whether that was a good idea for about 24 hours. And then he realized this is ridiculous. This is absolutely outrageous. So rather than call Mrs. King, he called the judge, which is sometimes more effective. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the judge uh, stopped the sentence. And that and that was a big moment in the campaign because it meant that a lot of African Americans who had traditionally been Republican, um, because, uh, you know, I'm sure you know why in East Texas. Anyway, if you want to ask, I'll tell you, um, started to vote more Democratic. In fact, Martin Luther King's father, who was a Republican, said, I'll vote for a Catholic or the devil himself. That's what he thought of Catholics, the devil himself, <laughs> oh, which is pretty incredible. I know. I'm glad you understand. That's an amazing sentence. If he'll wipe the tears from my daughter's eyes, that is uh, my daughter-in-law's eyes. So I've got a, a church full of votes for Senator Kennedy. And so he really helped to get out the vote for Senator Kennedy. Martin Luther King, of course, was a little more self-righteous than his father and said, you know, the morally, just because the morally right is politically appropriate doesn't mean anything to me, and I won't tell anybody who I vote for. But he was, you know, listen, if you're going to run, run, if you're going to lead a civil rights movement, you have to be a little self-righteous, right? So he wasn't so convinced. He was not as, uh, to vote, but at least the father-in-law did. And those votes helped. So that's why I'm sort of thoughtful about what the role of churches are, because they helped to put John Kennedy into the White House. Interesting, don't you think? So basically, we grew up in this family. Um, we had a lot of dogs, which you may have heard about. Um, we had a lot of, we had cats, and not, we had, cat, we had dogs, and pigs, and chickens, and cows, and my brother connect, collected snakes, so we had about 100 snakes and armadillos. Um, and 
what are they called, those lizards? Cotamundi lizards. You know what a Cotamundi lizard is? Who has a who has an iPhone? Huh? Komodo lizard? Komodo dragon. Do you know what they are? They're about this big. And once he got my mother right here, and then the door was locked and she couldn't get out. She was really upset about that. <laughs> but my mother was a character. She grew up in a Republican family, and then she ma married into my father's family, which it was. What, what party do you think he was? Democrat. You guys are so smart. Um, and, uh, but she had this very, uh, you know, like, self-righteous stain. So we were riding one day, and um, she heard some horses. And going, wow, you nay, nay, very, very so. And she looked at the horses, and they were very thin and obviously malnourished. So she thought, well, that's wrong. So she had all of us um, and the groom, we had a groom, take the horses, there were about four of them, over to our, our house where we had a barn. And then the guy who owned the horses was angry that somebody took his horses away. I don't know if that happens in East Texas, but it happened in McLean, Virginia. And so she, um, he sued her in Virginia. And at that time, um, horse theft was a hanging offense. And that was my mother. I was like in third grade. My mother is accused of horse thievery. It's a hanging offense. And my father at that time was the Attorney General of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're the Attorney General, you're supposed to enforce the laws. It doesn't help that your mother, it does your wife, is being a horse thiefery. In fact, one of the great stories is, I'll tell you two stories about that. I don't know if you saw this in the film but about my mother, but... One, when you're, the, when you're the wife of a cabinet member, it used to be that you'd get a special license plate so people would be nice to you. And my mother, of course, my father, of course, would never allow my mother to get that special license plate because she knew, he knew that she would take advantage of it. <laughs> and that she was a little naughty and you really couldn't trust her with power. <laughs> yes, that, yes, she can how did you guess that? <laughs> it's totally scandalous. You're exactly right. Um, and anyway, luckily, um, luckily, she the uh, the jury let her out. But then my mother thought it was fun to make. So my mother would have parties at our house, and one uh, every. I, I, do you want to hear about this, or should I go on to something else? We'll do one more story about this, and we'll move on. Okay. <laughs> so one time. It was her 10th wedding anniversary, and I remember it was a big deal, and she had about 200 people, and I was calling under, this, under the tent so I could watch what was going on. And she put a plank across the pool, and she put, like, um, a, if the pool is like this, not as fancy as the pool at SFA. You have, like, really fancy pool. I can't believe it. And then it, there was a plank and then a little table here and a plank like that. So she could have, like, her and Supreme Court Justice Byron White and Arthur Schlesinger, who was an American, a great historian. So you had all these cabinet people and all these ambassadors and all these very important people, senators and congressmen. And then she was, had those three people sitting there. And then she got there and she jumped up and down on the plank. <laughs> So what happened? They fell in the pool. And it was a black tie dinner. So, so the headlines were kind of about my mother. And so the president, who did like my mother, but didn't think it was really appropriate that the wife of the attorney general not only is getting arrested for horse thievery, but is pushing people in the pool. So he called her up and said, you can't do that again. I could tell. I could spend the whole day telling stories about my mother, but I won't. Okay, so that's my Kennedy stories. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Right? You're all right with that? Okay. That, I started with that. It was 28. Okay, immigration. So um, who, who's going to guess what I'm going to say about immigration? What? You may want to know who in this class immigrated to this country. Uh, what a great idea. <laughs> How many of you, uh, who has immigrated in this country? 
So five, of, four or five. Four stu three students and one teacher, that's great. <laughs> okay, so immigration, who thinks I'm gonna be for immigration? Yeah, you're right. Okay, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> And you know, I'll just tell you a little bit about, I had, um, my great grandfather was a congressman from Massachusetts. And he didn't do a lot when he was a con, he was only congressman for three years. He didn't like being in Congress. He then became mayor of Boston and he liked being the mayor. Mayor is, mayor is a much better job than congressman. You can do stuff as mayor. Congress, you just argue with people all the time. But as his, the only thing he really got done as congressman is to say that if you, you could vote even if you couldn't speak English because he had a lot of um, Italians in his district. This is before the, and, they, and Germans in his district and he wanted them to vote for him. So he said they should vote. And he said anybody who's made the trek all the way to the United States should be able to vote. So he was very pro-immigration long before uh, it was very popular. As you may have heard, there used to be something called the Know Nothing Movement. Have you studied about the Know Nothing Movement? You have. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen the um, Washington Monument. Well, I don't know if you've ever noticed that the Washington Monument has two colors of stone. And do you know why it has two colors of stone? No, you know what the real reason is? <laughs> the real reason is it, it has to do with immigration. And there was this huge movement called the Know Nothing Movement, um, which basically really hated Catholics. And um, the Pope sent over a piece of stone to be put into the Washington Monument. And when the Masons who were building it saw this thing from the Catholic Pope, they had a riot. And they said, we're not going to have anything to do with the Pope, and we're not going to build any monument that has anything to do with the Pope. And they, it was about eight, 1854, and so they stopped building it. And so it wasn't until about the 1880s that the no nothing, you know, then they went through the Civil War, half finished, and then they finally got the money, and the Catholic Mason, the Catholics had gained much more power by the 1880s. They were, you know, starting to be the mayors in Boston, New York, um, a lot of the East Coast cities, Chicago, because of the large immigration, and they could therefore finish the Washington Monument. But because it was 30 years later, the color of the stone was different. So I'm, I tell you this because, and there's a sign in my office at home that says, help wanted, no Irish need apply. And that was from 1817, less than 100 years ago. There was this enormous anti-Catholic uh, prejudice. So I have always been very pro-immigration because I think that, number one, it's a great country. The more people we have from different parts of the world, the more the United States understands the world. Um, the United States made some big difference in Ireland because we had a lot of Irish. We're interested in Israel because we have a lot of Jewish people. We're interested in Africa because we have a lot of African Americans. And we will be much more interested in Latin America, that therefore that Latin American student exchanges because we have so many Latins. So I think it's a great notion and it teaches us more about the world. And um, also, Latin America, when we're going to get in this next stage, is a booming place right now. And it's, you know, we've had growth rates like in Colombia, Peru, Mexico, almost 8%. Um, Brazil was up to 8%, it's not doing quite as well today, but they're doing really well, and they're not going to want to send people to the United States. Their biggest trading partners of Brazil, Chile, and Argentina is China. So we need to make sure that we have good relationships with Latin America, and I think having immigration is very useful in that way. Now, I can talk more about immigration. Do I, any of you have any comments on that? I guess my only comment would be at what point, because I'm not against immigration either, but there's got to be a certain point. We can't let everybody in, and there's really no such thing as infinite growth. Not everybody can move to America and achieve that American dream that is the reason that people come to our country in the first place. Really? So, well, there is no such thing as infinite growth. I mean, look at our own economy. Well, you know, if you, first of all, can we, I would like to, to, I think you're, you've, you said some really interesting things. One about what is the American dream. 
And I want to talk a little bit about what the American dream is. Um, because the American dream was not about getting wealthy. That is a recent phenomenon of the last 30 years. That was, the American dream was living a good life, being able to participate in politics. You know, the, remember it says we have the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? You remember those words? Mm -hmm. Do you know what they meant by pursuit of happiness? No, that was liberty. Remember, life, liberty, liberty and freedom, same thing. What do they mean by pursuit of happiness? I'll tell you. What? Participate in politics. That's what happiness was. Because they wanted, because in, before they were under the uh, control of the king of England. And they couldn't participate. They couldn't get their voices heard. Remember that the slogan was not no taxation. It was no taxation without representation. They were fighting to be represented because they thought there was this notion in the 18th century about what happiness was. And it was this notion of public happiness, which we've lost. We've shrunk it down just as we shrunk God. To, and I'll get into that in a minute. But um, And happiness was supposed to be we can join together with our fellow human beings and make decisions to make our communities better. That's what it meant by happiness. And now it's been turned into, you know, how, how much stuff do you have, not how you create a better life. But in the 18th century, happiness was public happiness. It's a very different notion. And the American dream was you can get under, out from those, those kings and dukes and popes who were telling you what to do in Europe and you could come to the United States and farm your own land and work hard and create a community. It was not about how rich you could get. That is a completely new phenomenon that was not part of the, uh, of the American dream at all. It wasn't about wealth creation. It was about living a better life in which you could have a voice in what happens to you. Clearly, not everybody agrees with me on this. But that is, if you look at your history, and if you want to go check me out, go read Hannah Arendt on revolution. That's just what she says. She's a great philosopher. Anyway, um, if you look at the, the places where, uh, you know, like Baltimore. We, we now have a mayor in Baltimore who has a specific goal to recruit more immigrants. Because she says she knows that immigrants work really hard, they create businesses, they you know they start the bodegas or they start all sorts of businesses, and she thinks that's the way to revitalize Baltimore City. You look at where the where where are the most vibrant places in our country, in terms of ideas and businesses and jobs, uh, besides Texas. <laughs> Los Angeles, huge immigrant population. New York City, um, huge immigrant population. Chicago, I mean, it, that's, so it's an interest. I mean, not everybody's gonna come, and I'm telling you, they're really not gonna come because there are all these jobs that are now being created in Latin America. So it's an interesting uh, situation. Okay, but you raise a good, po I mean, you do raise a really good point. I mean, we're not gonna have the whole world come to the United States, but we could have a lot more. And also, just, I know that I don't look 62, but I am. So, <laughs> it means that I can retire really soon. I'm not going to, but I can. And I need somebody to support me. And although I've done my best by getting my four children and two grandchildren, they're not going to be enough. I have very expensive tastes, so I want the immigrants <laughs> <laughs> to come and help. And that's a really interesting way. How are we going to... How are we going to make sure that this country keeps growing? Um, you know, when I asked how many large families there are, there are not a lot more Ethel and Robert Kennedys than what your parents of 12 kids. Most of you didn't raise your hands. So you probably only have, you know, one or two or three kids. So we need more people. Nah. I know I'm not compelling to you, but at least you listen to me, which is very nice of you. Okay. Um, anyway, you asked how to make our, our economy grow. Immigration. 
of the 10 big companies that have been formed by the United States in the United States in the last 10 years, 20 years, uh, I think eight of them have been formed by immigrants. Google, you've heard of Google? An immigrant formed Google. I can't remember all the rest. They're just, they're just doing really well. So it's, what happens is, is immigrants have, anybody who's willing to leave their home and family, they've got a lot of guts and energy and go get them. Whereas most of us become lazy after the third generation. Not me. <laughs> you guys are great audience. You just laugh at my jokes. I really prejudice. I mean, okay, any other questions about immigration? Yes. Do you think immigration is stigmatized as something negative to just so people can use it as an outlet for America's fiscal problems? Like people maybe use immigration as an excuse to why America is in the situation that it's in? Or you know, immigrants actually give more to the economy than they take. I mean, because, um, well, as I said, the ten, uh, I think eight of the ten largest companies were formed by immigrants. M many people, illegal, what do they call it? I illegal immigrants, I mean, they pay their taxes and they don't get the services. So they're good. They're very, as, as Mayor Bloomberg says, they mostly don't get in trouble with the law because they know they're going to be deported if they do, so they're much more law-abiding than others. So it's actually really an interesting phenomenon that, that you really help, immigrants help the economy. Um, there is always a fear, and that's why I started talking about the Know Nothing movement of the 1850s. There's always been in the United States a fear of the other. I mean, it's natural part of human like that we don't like people that aren't like us. And the question is, how do we see people? Do we see them like us or do we see them as different? And, um, you know, that's, that is a, a challenge. And so to the extent that you say you blame the immigrants for our... Oh, no, I was saying... No, not you, but that people blame... <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. I'm not, no, whoa, I am not going there. Um, no, I, I can blame the banks. That's who I would blame. And the Republicans, of course. <laughs> yes. I was just going to um, ask you this question. A lot of people do blame the immigrants because they think um, that they're taking God's space and everything else. That's probably what she's getting yeah. at. Possibly a No, it's really actually just the opposite. Uh, uh, well, they're, they're different types of immigrants. No, I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying that's how some people view it. Yes, I know. But some people want... Let me tell you about people. <laughs> People don't look at facts. Have you studied all that? Who's in, they, they have their ideas, and if you give them a fact that they don't like, they become more convinced that they're right. Mm -hmm. Have you set, done that? Mm -hmm. I thought that was, that was one of the studies of the last five years that really stunned me, although it's been my experience. Um, the, you, can, you can see what happened. I think it, this is true in Alabama. The... Um, In Alabama, many crops went unpicked because Americans didn't want to pick the crops. They wanted the uh, immigrants to pick the crops. So large numbers of, of counties have had real problems getting their crops picked. Um, I've talked to people in Michigan who ran hotels, uh, what are they called, you know, summer hotels, tourist hotels, and they couldn't find Americans to work in the hotels. And they're... So that's the low-wage workers on one hand, and then you have lots of businesses are saying we want, you know, the the engineers because we don't have we're not producing as many engineers in the United States as have, for instance, um, you know, India, and we need those engineers and we want them here. Or if you nurses, I mean, I don't know if you've been to a hospital recently. And again, I don't know Nagadoches like you guys do, or even Texas, but in Baltimore, many of our nurses come from the Philippines. Um, because we didn't have it, we weren't producing enough nurses. What does that say about our education system? What does it say? Oh, we can do a lot better on our education. Absolutely. Focus on our education. But we have not focused, which is really unfortunate. No, we'd rather go to war. We'd rather what? Go to war. Yeah. I don't know if we'd rather go to war we have gone to war. You're exactly Almost right. Like continuously. Continuously. 
it's still it's, I know although we used to have a much better education system uh, as as compared to the rest of the world um, and now the rest of the world is surpassing us in education and on health care it's really horrendous horrendous you're exactly right you're right um, so any other questions any other comments yes of course I'm a Democrat <laughs> I mean you know I just give you an example every other industrial nation has universal health care and they have better health outcomes than the United States they have a lower they have longer life expectancies they have lower um, what is it called when you have more uh, earth and child mortality I mean my daughter, I have four daughters, as you've now heard, and my youngest um, did an exchange. She went to Denmark last year. The kids are paid to go to college. Paid. They all have universal health care. They've been named, Copenhagen, the happiest city in the world. And it's freezing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just crazy we should not have to worry about health care we should worry about other things but we should not have to worry about health care and you have this governor I mean I was talking to um, a former mayor of Nagadoches and you, know, sh you have a choice where do your tax dollars go to your lo probably not your tax dollars because you probably don't pay too many taxes but if you did pay taxes, I mean, if you did, you have a choice in Nagadoches. Do you could, you could put your taxes into schools or economic development or into your hospital because your hospital has to take care of people who don't have the money to pay, right? Mm -hmm. So you have made this decision. I have now learned this, and I could be wrong because I could have misunderstood. But what I understand is you decided to put your money into the hospital. If you had a smart governor, he would have taken Obamacare and your hospital costs would be covered by the federal government and you could just put your money into education in your own community. Okay. I love the fact that you're all nodding at me. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's crazy. It's nuts. And we should not be fighting over, how, I mean, we, we, to have a strong... We can, I mean, Medicare is too, you know, is going too expensive, and I can tell you why. I mean, we spend most of our money on the last three months of life. We spend a third of the money on Medicare, on our health care system, on obesity. So there's a lot we could do here and make sure that we don't spend, have such high costs. If we ate better, exercise more, uh, drank liquor less. I know that's a hard thing to say in college. <laughs> I guarantee my daughter has told me, oh, I'm 21, I can now drink. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think she drank before she was 21. <laughs> she was on the rugby team, which means you, you drink. Okay, um, enough of that. What else would you go on to? Latin America, okay, should we move on or do you want to move on to something else? Huh? Yes? Okay, Latin America. <laughs> Okay, so I'm actually, um, I, I do a number of different things. Um, and one of the things that I do is I'm the special advisor um, at the State Department. And my, what I've been asked to do is to encourage student exchanges in Latin America, as I said. Because, and I'll just give you some statistics, and then I'd like to hear from you um, what you think we could do better to encourage student exchanges. Okay, let me give you some statistics. One, in the last 10 years, um, the number of Latin Americans uh, who have grown into the middle class is 52 million. That's a lot of people in a decade time to go into the middle class. In the United States, we've had about 50 million um, uh, Hispanics. So we have a large Hispanic population. So you would think that would, they, they would pay attention to Latin American as the Irish paid attention to the Irish, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, they are one of the gr fastest growing economies. You can tell from the growth of the middle class. They, uh, between that Latin America and North America, we're going to have more energy than the Middle East. 
So there is a lot of interest. In, um, we have Brazil, which has one of the best um, programs for uh, alternative energy uh, in the world. They're known for that. Um, there's enormous resources in Latin America, and uh, there are a lot of Americans who are big Fortune 500 companies are now moving into Latin America. Most fortunate, and this goes to the economy, and your, your very interesting jobs question, you know, the stock market is going up. I don't know if you've seen that in the last few days. You may not be pay attention, but it's going up. But where the, where's the money coming from? The jobs are being created overseas, the job growth, often. I mean, all these companies are building in, in Brazil and Colombia and Peru and Mexico, and their consumers are in Walmart, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Marriott Hotels. They're, all this expansion is in going on, as you know, in Latin America. So that's where the, they may call themselves American corporations, but in fact, their, their people and their customers are often in Latin America. So we need to do a better job of understanding that and saying that we're really part of one hemisphere. Um, and we have a problem with that because Latin North America has not always been very good to Latin America. We've often used them as sort of, at least as particularly in Central America, as kind of a, we've been a colonial power. I don't know if that's too much to get into in five minutes. But anyway, we have been. Um, so we've got to do a better job. What I've heard is that a third of you are from East Texas, and a third are from like Houston, and a third from Dallas. Is that about right? Um, Where are you from? I was born in Iowa, but my dad's in the Army, so we moved everywhere. Oh, so you moved years. everywhere. So you've moved all over the yeah. place. Like, you're not fearful. Like yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So that's great. Um, anybody else wanted to say anything about student exchanges? Yeah. It's just the fear of the unknown and going someplace that you like you wouldn't have to sort of from scratch. And like I personally am not very good at Spanish, so I would just kind of be lost by myself. And so like I think that's one barrier that I personally would have. But I would love to do it. But. Right, but if for instance SFA had a program to go to Costa Rica, for instance, or. Uh, Guatemala, you know, there's this beautiful place in Guatemala called Antigua, which I'm sure you've been to. Um, and, you know, you're, you're going to be with 30 people, your peers, there's a dorm that's safe, you go in at night, and they take you on trips, and you learn Spanish. It would be pretty cool. I mean, everybody should learn Spanish, given the population, the Hispanic population. That's my view, not that I've learned it. But <laughs> so you can always say things even though you don't do everything that you say. It's true. <laughs> Obviously, learning another language, um, the, particularly Latin America, that is a booming economy. I mean, I've been to Europe. I go to Europe a lot for some reasons. And a lot of kids are going, because as you know, the European economy is not doing so well. They're all going to Latin America. I mean, they are just there because there are jobs there, and that's, that, that's happened. So to the extent that you, can, you have the skills to travel the world and go where the jobs are, that's going to be helpful to you personally. That's not about the American economy. It's just about how do you become personally able to, to uh, be strong. And clearly, there's a lot going on in Latin America. What I think is going to happen in the United States is um, I think that we have this incredible um, fuel-based economy. I mean, I think the natural gas and the, the fracking for all its environmental problems, and there are environmental problems, are really going to help America be energy independent and consequently uh, means we don't have to go, to go to war over oil which is really a nice thing um, that we don't have to do. It means that there'll be more tax revenues into local state and federal government coffers, which will make things easier for everybody. There will be new jobs created around, certainly around um, not only drilling, but refining. And there'll be no more, new more manufacturing jobs, which is already happening because our, our fuel costs are about one-fifth the European costs. So the boom that you are, some of you are experiencing in East Texas is going to really help the United States. Tomorrow, I'm very excited, I'm going to visit, which you have 
20 or 15 miles from here, the largest biomass plant in the United States, which, did you know that? Who knew? I didn't know either. I learned this last night. I said, I got to go visit. You have the bio, largest biomass plant in the United States uh, that takes all the, the, the wood chips from the forestry um, industry, and it is have been bought entirely by the city of Austin. <laughs> Such information. Um, and so I think there's also going to be a lot of interest in alternative energies because, as you can see, our our, our climate is changing. Um, you know, we didn't have the Sandies when I was growing up. We didn't have these huge, weird, I mean, last week it was 70 degrees in Washington, D.C. The year be week before it was 28 degrees. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird. And, and that's what was predicted with climate change. And it's scary and difficult. And um, there's going to be a lot of new building, uh, what is called abatement um, services to deal with climate change. And again, that's going to be new types of building and that will be a new industry. So I think there's a lot going on. And I think we'll do healthcare differently too. And all of that will create jobs much better if we have excellent education, which is really the key. And that has to be our focus. And that comes from parents, students, politicians, teachers, everybody being engaged. Okay, I guess I am finished. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was great to be with you. Really, very, very good. Thank you.